Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the a hydropower coffee hour. I'm so glad that everybody could join us. Um, my name is Andrea Donlin. I'm a river steward for the Connecticut River Conservancy. And I'm here with a couple of other staff. Uh, Kathy, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, Kathy Erfer. I'm river steward for Connecticut River Conservancy in Vermont and New Hampshire. Stacy, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Stacy Leonard. I'm the events coordinator here at CRC. Welcome. And I also know that we have Kelsey and Brett if they want to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Kelsey. I'm the river steward in Connecticut and mostly listening in today. Hello, everyone. Uh, Brett Morrison uh, from Vermont, but uh, working to support the, the whole watershed. Great. Well, we wanted to uh, take some time for folks who have um, who are here representing an organization or an entity to introduce themselves, although we have so many participants that we probably can't go completely around the room. But um, could we start off with uh, David Brühl? Sure. Hi. So I'm uh, David Brühl. I have, wear a lot of different hats. I'm the chairman of the Nolan Beaker Project, and Joe Gravelin has been our representative on these discussions. I'm also uh, chairman of the Montague Historical Commission, which is I'm very proud of, and I am the new chairman of the Western Nahantic community at the mouth of the Connecticut River. So that's what I am. That's what I do, among other things. Before we move on, sorry, I just want to point out that we are recording this and we're doing that so that we can share it for folks that were not able to attend today. And um, we just want you to know that we're recording it before you, you know, choose to speak or not. Um, and it'll be published just for as an educational resource for people to be able to uh, listen to. Sorry, David. OK, go ahead, Andrea. Um, I'm not uh, in my order. <clears throat> the screen is, is good. But um, Janelle, do you want to identify yourself? Sure. Yes. Hello. My name is Janelle Knockleby. And I work at the Great Falls Discovery Center in Turner's Falls, Massachusetts. We're part of the state park system through the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. And we are a free state park when there's no pandemic. And we um, are open year round. Uh, and our focus is on the natural, cultural, and industrial history of the whole Connecticut River watershed. Often there's plenty to talk about that it's just local. So we, we cover local stuff pretty well too. Um, and we've got um, habitat dioramas that depict life from um, the North Woods at the border of Canada and New Hampshire where the river starts all the way to Long Island Sound. So um, it's a great resource for getting to know your wildlife neighbors and also for programming and uh, now more and more some self-guided opportunities. So um, that's um, what who we are at the center. I'm the visitor services supervisor there. So I help coordinate your welcome experience at, when you enter and um, I work on the programs. Um, everything from story hour to uh, vendors to working with partners um, and uh, collaborating with quite heavily with our friends group. So that's what we're about. Thanks, Rich. Would you like to identify yourself? Uh-huh, Julioni. Kwai mziwi awani and delawizi lit standai wan tastagaku tsisokwa kik pa kwenongu zian. We go down namiolan pam gisigak. My name is Rich. It's good to see you, my friends. I live up the river, the Kwenetuk in Wan Tastagak, which you know better as Brattleboro. I represent as a spokesperson for Elnu Abeniki and for the contemporary Abeniki community at large. Uh, in these uh, relicensing processes on the river, 
uh, the river is the heart of the people. The land is the people and the people are the land. And so these things are very, very important. Um, I will, uh, I also work with all these other fine people that are here. We're not, I'm not on in this by, by myself, we're in this together. So I thank you for convening this meeting and I look forward to discussing this with all of you today. Uliwani, thank you. Thank you, um, Joe Gravelin. Uh, Joe Gravelin, past president of the Nolan Beaker Project, um, author of the uh, Traditional Cultural Properties um, report that I submitted to FERC, which, which became part of the process. Also a vice chair of the Northfield Historic Commission, and I sit on a, a couple of boards with David out there for David Brewer for other uh, cultural preservation works. Great, thank you. Um, is there anyone else here today who would like to introduce yourself and who your and your affiliation? Scott Osgood. Yeah, just to introduce myself. I'm the city planner in Claremont, New Hampshire and it's a beautiful river to see quite often here. And so I'm just interested in seeing what's, what's, uh, what, what we need to do. That's it. Great. I guess I, I could jump in and say, I'm John Bennett and uh, wearing a couple of hats. Uh, probably foremost is, um, Wyndham Regional Commission in Brattleboro, and we're trying to collaborate with many folks, uh, including other regional planning commissions and agencies um, to comment to FERC on the whole relicensing process. Um, one of the other hats I wear is on the Franklin County Conservation District Board. I'm Raul Debregard. I'm here on behalf of the Connecticut River Gateway Commission. At the mouth of the Connecticut River, <clears throat> all the water that you uh, stop or generate up there comes down the river and ends up at the bottom of the river in the mouth. <laughs> Thanks, Raul. Uh, Elizabeth Davis, you have your hand, virtual hand raise. Yes, I'm Elizabeth Davis. I'm with the League of Women Voters of Amherst. The three legal women voters in Western Massachusetts did a study of the Connecticut River issues way back in the 1960s. And I'm taking uh, my um, charge from that. I'm following Connecticut River issues, specifically the relicensing. Uh, this is Nancy, can I say a few words? Um, Nancy Hazard and I'm representing Green and Greenfield. And Green and Greenfield um, is interested in sustainability in a very broad way. Uh, that sweet spot where social equity and um, economic vitality and environmental quality overlap. And I recently submitted a request for more information from FERC uh, pertaining to the Northfield Mountain facility. And uh, the, some of those concerns, mostly uh, river erosion issues, as well as the whole issue of uh, climate change emissions and their false claim that this facility is a zero carbon facility. Michael Leff. Hi, I'm Michael Leff. I am now the executive director of the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Districts. And um, recently wrapping up some work I've been doing for several years for the Franklin County Conservation District, uh, finally completed our report on strategies for um, managing sustainable access to our waterways, public access to our rivers and streams. Walter Ramsey. Yeah, I'm Walter Ramsey. I'm the town planner for the town of Montague in the village of Turner's Falls, where there's a, a major dam on the Connecticut River, um, following the relicensing process closely. And um, the town is uh, the lead partner in a National Park Service study to um, study um, the, the Battle of Great Falls, a massacre that occurred here um, almost 400 years ago. 
Um, so there are some traditional cultural properties in our town. So we're very interested in, in following this closely and making sure that um, those interests are protected through the relicensing process. Janet Pritchard. Hi, I'm a landscape photographer and professor of art at the University of Connecticut, currently working on a photographic project on the Connecticut River. And I'm just here to educate myself, so thank you. Michael Hoffman. Hello, I'm Michael Hoffman. I'm a, it's a Brattleboro Town member. Um, moved here three years ago. I have a small farm in, in Brattleboro and I'm uh, mulling over a regional sort of business enterprise and I need to understand more about the area. Wyndham County and upper the, uh, the Connecticut River and the history sort of with the um, Native, Native American influence to try to include, include them in the process. So this is very informational for me. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, I thought since the theme of our discussion, we're here today to sort of talk about the the hydropower relicensing of the five facilities, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts all together. Um, we're a big group and, um, and our theme for the day is traditional cultural properties. Although if we run out of stuff to talk about or if anybody has burning questions having to do with the relicensing in other subjects, we can, we can talk about that. But we, we have some um, great participants today. And I was wondering if um, one of you would be willing to talk sort of about the FERC relicensing process um, with regard to traditional cultural properties. How is it done? What's happened so far roughly? Um, what do you want out of it? And I think, Kathy, you've said, Rich, Rich, you've done that at different meetings. I don't know if you want to start off or whether you want to share sort of your perspective on how it's gone? Uh, Sui, for sure. Um, I, I will also like to open room for Joe and, and David um, because they were in on this very early also. <clears throat> but to, in summation, traditional cultural properties, also uh, typically known as a TCP, that's the acronym you're gonna run into. These are uh, aspects that are included in the National Historic Preservation Act, NHPA, another set of letters. And the NHPA is required to be considered in any federal uh, permitting or licensing procedure, including those conducted by FERC, F-E-R-C, another set of letters. Um, federal Energy Regulatory Commission, I think. Uh, my brain's starting to blur over already. Um, so FERC, in the process of relicensing hydropower facilities on the river, in our case, the Connecticut, the Quinnetook, um, they are required to take various statutes into account. And one of those is NHPA. And in this case, a part of the NHPA uh, called Section 106. Section 106 has to do specifically with uh, places that are of cultural interest um, to indigenous and other people. We tend to seize upon the indigenous aspect, but it's not necessarily restricted to that. Um, but in this case, that's what most of us are here about. There are also other historic properties. Within that section 106 subsection, um, there is another relatively new and somewhat unexplored category called traditional cultural properties, TCPs. TCPs are more about context, cultural context, than discrete sites or material evidence. They may, invo they may involve those, definitely, as contributing factors. Now, what we're getting into here is the idea that people are in relationship with land. And the aspects of that land inform how they interact with it. Traditional cultural properties are exactly that. 
they are hard to define if you're outside of the culture. Um, that kind of makes sense. It goes without saying, but it's, since this is all part of uh, black and white federal rules, uh, people think you can just, you know, run out and uh, check it out and check off the box and say that you're done. Uh, it's not that easy. In order to understand what a cultural landscape is, you need to speak to the people who embody that culture. Those are, in this case, particularly the indigenous people of that place. Those are, um, in this area in particular, I'm up in Wantastagok, Brattleboro. This is Sokoki, a Beneke country. These are the people who interact with this place and who know it in this manner. Sokoki Abenaki homelands run all the way down to the Great Falls, what you know as Turner's Falls. It is a name I choose not to use. That is not, um, I say that respectfully to those who are there now, but that's not how uh, the Beneke people see it. So homelands run down there and, there and in that place at the Great Falls, we intersect and overlap with other peoples, the Nipmuc, the Pocumtuck, the Mohican, and others who have traveled in and out as allies, friends, neighbors, and kin. When I name all of these people, I want to um, affirm that human beings are not the only people here. These are all people, the fish, the trees, the rocks, the river herself, and our mother, which holds it all. So when we're talking about relationships with place, we're talking about all of these things at the same time, and you start to get an idea of what context we're talking about. So uh, this is a federal statute when the licensees in the persons of the corporations of First Light and um, Great River and its predecessor, TransCanada, when they went about their licensing uh, applications, they compiled a list of studies that they were required to do in order to meet these requirements. Uh, both of these licensees agreed to conduct a traditional cultural properties study among their vast set of studies, fish, fisheries, recreation, uh, water quality, all of these things. So they did that. Um, each of these corporations hired a consultant because this is kind of a specialty thing. And uh, First Light hired a consultant um, from a, a firm in Maine, New England based firm. Um, and uh, Great River now uh, formerly, boy, my brain is just blurring over too, <laughs> too many facts. Um, Great River, Great River as TransCanada hired a consultant out of Oregon, um, pretty far away, uh, but this guy was pretty good. Uh, I think he did uh, a good job uh, to the degree he was able to, and they did their studies and they filed them and they checked the box, all right? They uh, met their requirements. Um, at that point, was about, that's about the time that I came into this process in 2015. This has been going on for a long time, long, long time, and we're not done yet. We're getting close. I came into the process at that point representing for Elnu Abeniki uh, for cultural interests for the people about whose relationships we were discussing. And um, I pointed out that they had not spoken to us. Um, in my mind, a traditional cultural property that does not involve consultation um, with whoever is uh, invested in that place is not a consultation. Uh, it kind of makes sense to me. Since then, I have been keeping my foot in the door despite their protestations that these, that these studies are complete. Um, keeping my foot in the door saying they're not done. We're still here. We would like to talk about this so that it's meaningful. And I'm waiting for answers. And so we've been in a holding pattern for six years and we're getting down to the crunch. Um, I'm gonna stop right there. Joe was involved in this process before I was and um, was instrumental with Nolan Bika and others in getting it put in place requiring these studies. Um, as I've described, they've fallen short 
Um, so we're in a, in a position of trying to figure out what to do now. Um, federal governments and corporations are, are relatively intransigent and they do not respond easily, adequately, uh, if at all. So, um, and, and this is reflective, I could say, of the entire process, the entire process. This river uh, is a commons. It does not belong to us. It does not belong to the corporations, but we are responsible for how we go about dealing with it. And um, it's not going that well. So uh, maybe Joe. Are you all set, Rich? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I hope you'll come back into the conversation as it, as it matures here. Um, so it is a check the box process. Yes. That's how the federal government worked. Uh, it's uh, such a sterile process when you check a box, you don't, you don't see what's left behind and what's not accounted for. You check a box and, and a bureaucrat looks at it and says, yep, good to go. Um, so I wanna read you a, a, a short list of uh, what a traditional cultural property studies is supposed to um, look at. Uh, the, uh, it's supposed to look at locations associated with traditional beliefs of an Aboriginal indigenous group about its origins. That's really important about its origins. It's cultural history or the nature of the world and cultural landscape. It's supposed to look at a rural community whose organizations, buildings and, buildings and structures or patterns of land use reflect the cultural traditions valued by its long-term residents. And we're talking long-term, we're talking, well, the archeology span in Northfield goes back 9,000 years and they didn't get up onto the higher terraces, which would have gone back 10, 11, 12,000 years. Locations where Native American religions, pra religious practitioners have historically gone and are known or thought to go today to perform ceremonial cultural rules of practice. Locations where community has traditionally carried out economic, artistic, or other cultural practices important in maintaining its, its historic identity. Um, the body of work created around this is pretty extensive. All of it should have been available publicly on the FERC websites. Rich is right. We, along with the help of uh, Doug Harris, the tr then at that point, tribal uh, Deputy Tribal um, Historic Preservation Officer of the Narragansett Tribe, we approached uh, First Light in TransCanada to attempt to set up a, um, a mechanism by with which um, those things that Rich are talking about could start to happen. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, challenges with doing that was the fact that there was, uh, there were really no um, budgets set aside for indigenous people. There are only budgets set aside for, for the dominant culture. And um, I addressed that a number of times with FERC, uh, but I might as well have been screaming in a pillow. Um, so, they're talking about the landscape associated directly within the project APE, the area of potential effect. But the way that these co traditional cultural practices occur, occur on a lot of the streams that come into the river and they occur on the It's associated with making their way down to the river at some point during ritual. And um, we did not get uh, any any true tribal input on this project up, at, up to the time where, um, where I uh, took a leave of absence from the Nolan Beaker project. So as I had mentioned before, um, there was a failed attempt by the uh, Narragansett tribe to engage with Dr. Wills and Dr. Wills had a, a bit of a um, disrespectful uh, exchange, verbal exchange with, uh, with Doug Harris about whether or not he was ever going to be able to be part of this. Um, to this day, that still runs really deep inside of me when I think about what had happened for that. So when you're talking about a, a traditional culture property study, you're supposed to be talking to the people that have that body of knowledge that talks about 
uh, about the river, about the um, activities that occurred, about the um, natural resources that occurred, how they were utilized, and to and the way that it was attempted to be done was a uh, as a typical let's pick up a book or something and and see what we can read. Well, you're not going to find that information that way. You need to be talking to people like Rich, Doug Harris, and and other people who um, have been in and around this landscape and have recognized where the real where the real culture was taking place. I mean, there's a lot of uh, oral tradition that goes down with this, not just with tribal people, but with but with the uh, uh, the common culture that have had experiences with tribal people and also with the land and that hasn't happened this has been an incredibly sterile process up to this point as richard mentioned the land is a living uh the river is a living thing it, it is an entity unto itself and we know that um in new zealand they give rivers they give rivers status as, as people and i really think that the this being the only blue wave Blue uh, Way River in the United States that, that that got this certification. At the very least, this river ought to have ought to have um, status as a as a citizen of of the all the states that it moves through. Um, so the traditional cultural property study, as it was conducted, leaves a, a lot to be desired. Riches riches available. And he hasn't been, and and El New have not been properly tapped tapped into for their cultural ex expertise. We're talking about the bypass reach that is such a sticky area because the Nolan Beaker project is a stakeholder in that, and so much four six acres from El, that three quarters of a mile stretch from below the dam where Fall River comes in all the way to the confluence almost all the way to the confluence of the Deerfield River. And we attempted to communicate with FERC and First Light and Trans Canada about the fact that, um, that so much of, of what had value traditionally as, as cultural practices uh, can, can no longer take place. There's no access to the um, ceremonial um, activities that would have occurred and that should have occurred um, since, the, since the Great Falls massacre 400 years ago. And, but also fishing, uh, the fishing, the, the access to the fishing there, the access to the water flow there. And that's a problem that's, that, that seems to plague the town of Montague because they don't, they can't separate their tax base from the amount of water that goes down through the canal. So there's a lot to talk about here. And I, I think I'd like to see it open up and, and see what other folks are feeling about this. We've had some questions coming in the chat, but David ruled, would you like to um, add to what's been said? Or You're muted. I could say, I can certainly say a few things. Uh, one being that I'm very overjoyed to have my brothers, uh, Rich, and Joe here with me. Uh, among the three of us, we represent literally the reach, basically from the source to the mouth of the river. And it uh, really is important to uh, recognize that, that many, many communities are still there and thriving, many indigenous peoples. Uh, one group that is not represented are the Nipbuk, who uh, also uh, visited or uh, oftentimes inhabited the area uh, in the stretch uh, where the Abenaki territory or considered homelands dropped off. So uh, I have, I joined this even later than did Rich and uh, Joe Gravelin has carried the, carried the ball for us a long time now. Most of my um, uh, insights have been uh, anecdotal in the sense that people have shared with me what their frustrations were. Uh, one of my, uh, our colleagues from the Aquina Wampanoag was uh, uh, present on a lot of the uh, research, very frustrated that there was an incredibly limited uh, border from the edge of the river inland that was actually visited and investigated. Um, 
<clears throat> one of the things that Walter Ramsey and I have in common, of course, is that we are uh, principal uh, players in the uh, study of the massacre and counterattack that happened right at the falls, uh, much of which is underwater now. And so uh, the impact of the impoundments and the uh, seeming disregard for cultural properties has been incredibly uh, difficult for us to, to stand. The, uh, at the foot of the falls is a beautiful shining hill called Wissatinawag. Uh, we are also stewards of that property, the Nolambika project is, and thanks to people like Joe who saved it from destruction. Uh, we are frustrated by the rulings that prevent uh, further studies on Wissatinawag, or at least for the protections. We are, con we are frustrated with um, the overlapping uh, interests uh, that Joe talked about, the bypass. We have an incredible uh, historic cultural resource in a the site called the Rock Dam, which has been forever a uh, fishing area, an incredibly sensitive place for uh, short-nosed sturgeon to be spawning. And we are concerned about the competing interests of increasing the flow through there or overwhelming uh, that particular cultural resource. So there are many, many um, anecdotal pieces of information that we are that I'm concerned with. But again, as I said, I'm very thankful that uh, both Joe and Rich have have been uh, um, so following this so closely. We all have many, many hats to wear in this life. Uh, but I am appreciative of the two these two men right now. So that's basically I, I have a bunch of little anecdotes that might be a little more, um, as I said, contentious. And I don't know the direction that this particular uh, discussion today will take, but I'll be glad to jump in and share some of those issues as we go. Thank you. Great. Uh, maybe I'll start by reading some questions in the chat and people should feel free to add more questions in the chat or if you want to raise your hand um, either on the screen or via the um, through the reactions there's a way to um, raise your hand some people have already used that um, one question was uh, for rich I hope you were able to comment on the traditional cultural report. Were you given that opportunity to comment on it? And if so, was there any response and was it adequate? And I think you later did respond, but I don't know if you wanna add um, more to that. Sure, I'd be happy to explain a little more. Uh, thank you, Andrea, and thank you for the question. Both Great River and uh, in the person of Trans Canada and First Light completed their studies with their consultants and filed them. I asked for follow up meetings, pointing out that we had not been engaged and there was no consultation. Had a meeting with Great River uh, with the license manager, with the consultant who came out from Oregon to talk to us, and a couple of tribal representatives. Uh, we discussed the shortfalls. Um, we pointed out, you know, exactly where we'd like to see the process go. Basically, as Joe pointed out, what they did was they completed a desktop survey. They surveyed the literature, they surveyed the databases, and they put it all into a nice little report. The, the, the Great River Report, compiled by the consultant from the North, Northwest, was actually a pretty decent, comprehensive survey. I think it ran up to 50 or 60 pages of uh, references all compiled into one place, but no consultation. They said that they were willing to consult. They said that they would um, like to engage on their terms. We said that was not acceptable. They needed to engage on our terms. It's not their culture. And uh, that's been the end of that one. Um, years later, we're still waiting. 
um, as I as I mentioned, we have asked to continue this con this uh, conversation. We are open. We are available. We don't care if this takes two years or if this takes ten years, but we want to talk about it. Ten years is nothing when you're talking about twelve thousand years. With respect to first light, same thing. They filed their report. I asked for a meeting. Chief and I sat down with the licensing manager of the time and with their hire consultant, Dr. Will. We had the same discussion. You completed a desktop survey. It's actually not a very good one. It's only about 17 pages long with the title pages and the cover letter and all of the references. It, it says almost nothing. And there was no consultation. Same thing. We asked to engage. We said we're available. However long this takes, we ask that our time and our knowledge be compensated. The consultants have been paid. Their contracts are fulfilled. They went home. They're happy. On to the next job. We're still waiting. That's where we're at. So maybe it um, would be good to also clarify that the companies were required to do um, studies on sort of historical properties, which is more um, buildings and architecture and that sort of thing, and archaeological studies and the traditional cultural property studies. So um, most of these documents were not actually accessible to the public um, because they, uh, particularly the archeological ones, um, contain information about sites and items and they don't want people going and digging stuff up. So um, it's hard to, as a member of the public, to sort of learn about it in a way that doesn't involve learning about sensitive <laughs> information. So um, uh, were Rich, Joe and, and David, were you um, given copies of all these studies? <laughs> Have you seen them yet? <laughs> Personally, I was not. Uh, Joe might be closer to this. Um, through the Northfield Historical Commission, we received copies of the archeological surveys that were done in our area. And, um, but that's it. Now, archeology span is not the study of the traditional practices of, of the people. It's, it's stone artifacts and um, possibly uh, hearth hearth charcoal and fire pits and, uh, and such. The traditional cultural property study is, is not about arrowheads. It's about the change and the, the exchange of life forces that occurred between the people that lived in and around the river and the river itself and the vegetation and the, and the fish and the animal life and that I haven't seen anything on, and that is the heart and soul of a traditional cultural property study. So to answer your question, I've seen the archaeology in the mass in the um, Northfield area. That's mm -hmm. it. Thanks. That's a good uh, distinction. Can I add to that, Andrea? Sure. So, uh, as Andrea points out, much of this. Um, compiled material is confidential and for good reason, because um, there's a lot of uh, lack of respect around these things. Um, and, and that is as it should be. Um, you don't allow uh, your, your average, uh, you know, religious practitioner does not allow the uh, person on the street to go rummaging through the back rooms of their tabernacles and their sanctuaries and their holy places. This is a similar, a similar uh, idea, but we're talking about the land. So this is all about notification and inclusion. 
this process. Um, I will say that at from the beginning that this is a federal process and the federal government decides who's a native person and who's not. Um, that's problematic right there. Um, native people are the only people in this on this continent that have to carry a card, according to the federal government, to prove who they are. How do you like that? If you don't fit through those hoops, um, and there are a lot of hoops, there are other uh, there are other ways to be, but um, suffice it to say that the federal government and FERC as its agent does not have to include anybody who is not a card carrying native person, a tribe with a capital T, so to speak. So the Beneke people in Vermont, uh, of, uh, of which Elnu is one, are one, um, are not federal tribes. They are state recognized tribes relatively recently. Um, New Hampshire does not recognize it's the Beneke people. Neither does Massachusetts, neither does Maine. That, uh, not, that notwithstanding, the federal government and agencies are beginning to recognize that this is problematic and they are allowing a degree of inclusion. Um, and so um, we do have party status at this point. We were not notified at the beginning. I was never told this was happening. It's why I came in late. Um, I can't speak to who exactly was notified. Basically, it was the federal tribes and a few others. So because of this notification process and being on or off of a mailing list, I have not been able to see most of the confidential documents, except by explicit request. When I have asked, they have been offered, and I have access to them. Um, they are never freely offered. After six years, I am still not on the mailing lists for some reason, in many cases. I, I don't understand. <laughs> six years, not even on the mailing list. So um, I have to track this down. I have to ask for it specifically. Um, I am on the notification list when things get filed at FERC. And let me tell you, you want to see your inbox blow up. Um, CRC knows what this is all about. It's, it's just endless. Um, and you have to look at everything so you don't miss something. The onus is on you to prove that you have interest. Um, it's, it's so backwards. But I have seen these things. Um, as I've already explained, they're, they're, not, they're not meaningful. Um, they're reports, and they're not engaging with the people who are being affected, um, including the river herself. Um, this is just called a resource. Um, I don't like that word. Um, we call it cultural resources. I call it cultural relations, and I'll leave it there. Okay, thanks. Um, one person requested links to copies of the traditional cultural property studies and Kathy has been doing uh, linking that or providing the study because the Northfield relicensing um, website is currently and hopefully temporarily down. Um, one person wrote in saying, I see no reason why a river should not be considered a person. Corporations are now considered people. Um, agreed, and somebody else agreed. Uh, there's been a discussion in the Greenfield Recorder op-ed pages a little bit about that. Um, there definitely are uh, countries that recognize that and other legal precedent um, that we probably won't be get into today, but um, it's an interesting path to follow. Um, let's see. Here's a question. Um, Nulhegan tribe who are at the headwaters of the river were not consulted either, correct, Rich? Um, I'll give a two-part answer to that. I, I cannot say whether they were notified way back at the beginning because that was over six years ago. Um, they may or may not have. Um, in, in, uh, in the follow-up to that, um, Chief Don Stevens has um, endorsed El Nuebenike's participation on their behalf. Um, 
because these relicensing um, facilities, uh, facilities being relicensed are primarily in the southern part of, of Abenaki territory. Um, and this is where Elnu is. Uh, we, we are open in, in open communication constantly with other tribal leadership. And so um, it's, it's not a matter of elbowing somebody out of the way, but um, capacity to be able to deal with this. And um, we're the ones that are here. So um, Nulhegan is, is involved by proxy, I could say. Um, okay. So one person had a suggestion that we use the list of attendees to continue to sell, send follow-up information, including the North, when the Northfield relicensing site is up and running um, and a link to the cultural resource report. We will definitely do that. Um, other general question, how, if at all, have you received support and or intervention from members of Congress, the senators and Congress people that represent the states and districts involved? Um, Kathy, do you wanna answer that one? Sure, we have, um, we have had some help with uh, members of Congress in attempting, you know, in this particular case, the, the process of how this relicensing unfold was, pro was problematic because there were multiple delays and we never got a, it, you know, at some point in the process, there's a beginning, there are studies that need to be done, there should be study reports, and then there should be a draft application, which which where the companies would put forward based on the information in the studies, what they would plan to do under the new license. Um, the, the public should be able to comment on that. And then there would be an application that would be adjusted based on the, the comments received. The process didn't go that way because there were delays. What ended up happening is the companies both uh, submitted a draft application before the studies were done with essentially the status quo of what they do now, no changes. And then um, they just finally recently, you know, there was a statutory deadline for when they had to submit their final application, which was May of, oh my gosh, 2018. They submitted a final application, which was exactly like the draft application with no protection mitigation or enhancement measures with many of the studies still not done. Um, and they just in this past December, December 2020, they submitted a revised final application, which finally has some um, real changes that they're planning for under this next license. So uh, the, the public essentially has not had the opportunity to, to comment on a comprehensive draft which would then go back to the company for further consideration. And so in that process, our congressional representatives, you know, attempted to work uh, with FERC to see if there was a pathway to change that um, and, you know, essentially to no avail. Um, so we have tried to engage our congressional folks, but it has not, uh, you know, um, not helped us greatly. And we continue to reach out to them, and you know, at least they may comment on the uh, on the final application, and those can't comments may carry a different kind of weight than, unfortunately, the the rest of us. <laughs> um, I want to be mindful of time. We have just about six minutes left, and uh, it's hard to have this conversation in this these little blocks of time. Um, there are a few more questions that we may be able to answer, but. I wanted to, um, we will follow up with an email to everyone who attended with some links for additional resources um, and a link to explain how to actually access the FERC docket, which, you know, is really important because uh, all of the information is in the public realm and you can look at the documents through the FERC docket. You can also look at the responses, right? So over the course of the past decade, really, um, there were responses, even when the traditional cultural properties was submitted, there were responses uh, and comments filed. Um, and so that information is useful as well. Um, the remaining 
questions kind of lop together um, are generally, what are some desirable outcomes that um, could happen? And then how do we get the process moving in a better, on a better track than it is now? Um, does anyone want to take a stab at answering one of those questions or both? <laughs> Joe. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll break, yeah, Rich, I'm sure Rich will fill in the gaps. So in 2015, <clears throat> the Lamica Project wrote a letter to FERC uh, and listed uh, some of the concerns that we had at that time. And so I, I, can, I can read the concern and then do the flip side of it. Uh, the first concern was, uh, devaluing tribal expertise, times, and resources. And as Richard said, um, he tried to engage to, to be uh, considered as having the value that all the other paid participants of this program, uh, of this process had. And we see that get around and uh, whatever the goal rate is for, for the value of, of uh, deep research and knowledge and and how it will um, will help out this this uh, licensing process. I'd like to see that ha be shown that FERC uh, acknowledge that and that the uh, utilities step up to the plate on that. The second one was the uh, of our concerns was the apparent the appearance of a breach of federal tribal trust relationship. Basically, the same thing that that I'm just talking about that Rich is talking about. The appearance of an attempt to build a case for 106 compliance in absence of tribal consultation. Here we are again. The appearance of an attempt to negatively prejudice the cultural significance of ceremonial stone landscapes to Native Americans, both inside and outside of the project APE. So to bring you, the public up to speed on that in 2007, the Department of the Interior acknowledged that the ceremonial hill at Taternus Falls Airport was, a, was a, a traditional cultural property that was significant and that it had a, 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 a landscape that was associated with it in a 16 mile radius around that airport. And I attempted to get uh, Dr. Wills to uh, acknowledge that and for, for the utilities to acknowledge that they had an obligation under that. And, and I might as well have been again, screaming into a pillow. I'd like to see that get turned around. I'd like to see that the fact that the ceremonial stone landscapes that exist on Wissatiniwag and the hillsides in and around the Connecticut River, certainly within that radius and beyond, start to be acknowledged by both the Massachusetts Historical Commission as well as the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the utilities. Uh, the, one of the other concerns was the significant emission of the cultural resources uh, and TCPs located in the project's APE. So David talked about that a little bit. They want to stop it at 10 meters in from the top of the hillside, but they didn't want to include the Wissatiniwag property into that. And, th and there's so much cultural information there. That was a continually um, habitated traditional uh, village site for over 10,000 years. And, and yet nothing from the Wissatiniwag site seems to have made its way into the uh, traditional cultural property studies. The challenges to the tribes uh, are, are part of this process, uh, access to this traditional cultural property areas that are located, sites located in and around the Great Falls are, are, are not addressed in the report. And that includes being able to do ceremony, particularly for the massacre at the Great Falls, but ceremony that had been happen, happening for thousands and thousands of years on this, on this body of water. What I'd like to say real quick is the traditional cultural property studies is about life force of this river and the people that lived on it and near it for, for thousands and thousands of years. That's what the traditional cultural property study is supposed to bring the, bring the light onto. And up to this point, and Rich can attest, it has failed to do that. And that's it for me. I will, I will add one minute's worth <laughs> in the interest of time. Um, basic, this process is a federal process. Um, there are rules that have to be followed. FERC is the agency in charge of this. They are the ones required to fulfill the re fill these, these statutory requirements, right? They delegate this responsibility to others because they don't have the time to do it and they're not here 
So they delegate it to the licensees. This is the fox guarding the chicken coop. So the corporations are the ones that are required to fulfill this and FERC needs to vet it. They need to sign off on it and say, you've done your job. So what I simply request is that FERC hear what is being said here and in the filings that these jobs are not done and that they require the licensees to follow through. The, the, this process needs to be determined by those who are uh, holding the interests, the cultural interests here, not by the corporations. FERC needs to require that. That's all I'm asking. Do your job. And part of how, uh, you know, this is where the public comes in, right? This is supposed to be a public process. And so th this, uh, this opportunity to comment to FERC, you know, FERC will do nothing really unless they are pushed and they know that people are watching them. So from our perspective at CRC, you know, we really are trying to engage people in commenting on this process. We um, will include it in the email, but we we submitted comments in January, essentially saying that these final applications were deficient and pointing out our concerns with, with what was not included, you know, what was not done. Um, anyone can do that. Anyone can write to FERC and say, you know, the application does not have the, the information uh, that it needs and, um, you know, point that out to them. After May, there will be a formal comment period where people can submit comments on the final application. And we really need, uh, you know, many of the members of the public to, to step up and, and speak to that um, and advocate for the companies to actually really do the job that they are supposed to do and do it well. Um, and so we'll put links to, uh, to that in the email. I, um, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, taking your time out this morning and joining us for this conversation. Um, we're going to try to continue uh, with these. We have two more planned to talk about uh, critters and then uh, recreation considerations in this relicensing. Um, and uh, we would invite you all to spread the word and reach out to us. We're glad to help answer questions, direct you to resources. Um, and any Andrea or our our fellow hosts, any additional words before we end? I, I want to address uh, there's a whole bunch of questions coming in about congressional delegations and who are the champions. I'm just going to answer that really quickly. I haven't been I have been in contact with Vermont's congressional delegation, all three people. They they are they listen, um, they say encouraging things they walk very carefully on these lines. They don't step into FERC business. That's FERC's business. They also have to have an economy, right? And so you don't step on the corporation's toes too much. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, a lot of this is up to you folks. Um, it's about the only way there is any purchase on this process. Thanks for that. If anyone has lingering questions that didn't get addressed, um, please, as Kathy said, reach out to us individually afterwards. Um, so glad that we could gather today and talk about all this. Um, it's a complicated process and um, CRC has been working really hard on this for the last uh, seven or so years or eight uh, but like folks have been saying, it, it really helps when there's a lot of voices um, for really does respond to um, comments. And I think when there's a lot different angles coming at them, it gets their attention even more. So um, thank you for your interest and participation. And um, we will be sending out follow-up emails. Um, Kathy, do you want to say any closing remarks? Thank you all. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Rich, Joe, David. 
and all the participants.